First at four, it was the Christmas Eve disaster that stunned the Macomb County neighborhood. Today, we're finding out what a financial settlement will mean for that community. Also, we'll get you ready for the presidential debate, the COVID precautions, the hot topics, and how we're putting the candidates through our trust index. Paula. Well, another byproduct of COVID-19, this one affecting our local teachers, and some superintendents say this could be a real problem. Hey Ben, it's pretty brisk out here today. It's definitely fall like Paula. We, most of us are getting a break from the rain, but there's more on the way in the next two days as temperatures tumble. Are we in for a frosty weekend? Answers right now, first at four. From downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and click on Detroit, local four news first at four starts now. Good afternoon, I'm Karen Drew. First at four, the Frazier sinkhole saga is finally coming to an end. You might remember the sinkhole destroyed homes and created a large pit on 15 Mile Road. It happened on Christmas Eve back in 2016. Well, today, Macomb County reached a $12.5 million settlement with the insurance company for three contractors. Experts found that a sewer line collapsed after sewage was released too fast into the system during a repair two years earlier. In total, 23 homes were evacuated. Three houses were damaged so badly they were condemned. County leaders say the money will be spent on infrastructure to make sure similar disasters don't occur in the future. What happened was really one of the largest infrastructure disasters, certainly the largest in Macomb County's history, and probably one of the largest in the entire state of Michigan. We're going to fix this moving forward. We're going to take that money, use that money moving forward so we don't have this problem again because in the long run, it's going to be a savings. Specifically, the money will be used to help pay for a $28 million project to upgrade another part of the sewer line. Work is scheduled to begin later this week. First at four, we are also tracking new cases of coronavirus and millions of dollars for small businesses in Michigan. Up first, you may have seen the alert on our Click on Detroit app as the state announced 898 new cases of COVID in just the past 24 hours. Plus, we did lose another 20 people to the virus, four of those deaths coming as they checked vital records. Today, Governor Whitmer's office says businesses statewide have received $69 million in grants to help with COVID recovery. Her office estimates nearly 73,000 jobs were retained for Michigan workers. In the past day, you've probably heard the worldwide death toll has passed 1 million. The U.S. has the largest share of those deaths with more than 200,000. We're also getting our first look at the CDC's guidelines for Thanksgiving. We'll talk a little bit more about that guidance in just a few minutes. Now, we have a local four update on that deadly crime that we have been following all day in Westland. Police have arrested a suspect in connection to a stabbing. It happened around one this morning on Palmer Road near Northgate. Police aren't sharing many details, but tell us the victim died at the scene. Investigators believe the victim and the suspect knew each other. So far, the department's still working to notify the victim's family. Suspect, meantime, is in police custody. City of Detroit announcing a new partnership to create more affordable housing in the city. The Detroit Housing for the Future Fund will direct $75 million in money to affordable housing. It's part of the city's efforts to preserve 10,000 units of existing affordable housing and create 2,000 units of new affordable housing. So far, $48 million has already been committed to the fund. That includes $15 million from J.P. Morgan Chase Bank and $10 million from the Kresge Foundation. If you feel that fall feeling in the air, you're not alone. Obviously, that cooler weather is moving in and going to stay with us for a bit. Let's get a peek at where things are headed this evening. Hey, Ben. Hey, Karen. Yeah, I had that argument with myself about whether to cut the furnace on today. It's getting to that point in Storm Tracker 4 shows we've got a couple sprinkles, but most of us are missing out on the rain. A lot of those sprinkles right now are in the north zone. You can see just sort of brushing northern Lapeer and parts of Sanilac County. You may see a few more of these before the evening is done, but generally, most of us will remain dry until tomorrow morning. That's when showers start to arrive for the morning commute. And once those push in, we're going to be with those rain chances for about 40, 48 straight hours, even though it's not going to be raining the whole time. Temperatures tonight falling into the 50s and will stay partly cloudy uh, or to, partly to mostly cloudy, I should say. Coming up, we'll look at our rain timing for the next two days, the temperatures that are coming over the weekend and whether or not we're going to see frost 
going into Saturday and Sunday. More on that in just a few minutes, Karen. Uh oh. All right. Thank you, Ben. No matter where you stand on the presidential race, the first debate will offer you a chance to see the candidates in action and decide who really shares your views. President Trump and Democratic nominee Joe Biden face off tonight in Cleveland. Kimberly Gill standing by in the newsroom this afternoon with a preview of what we can expect. Good afternoon, Kim. Hi, Karen. Good afternoon to you as well. The coronavirus has shaped this presidential race for months now, and tonight the pandemic will also affect how the debate plays out. But it's still, as you said, Karen, a great opportunity to compare the candidates side by side. Here's a look at some of the ground rules. There won't be a pre-debate handshake. Only 75 to 80 people will be allowed inside and everyone will be tested for the virus. The president, Joe Biden, and moderator Chris Wallace will not wear masks. The president will speak first, as decided by a coin toss. Both candidates will face questions on several topics, including their records, COVID-19, the economy, and the Supreme Court. We also have this video just into the newsroom. You can see President Trump there leaving Joint Base Andrews, getting on Air Force One. He actually may already be on the ground by now. He's expected to do some final preparations after he arrives in Cleveland. And we also have this video of former Vice President Joe Biden leaving from Delaware. Neither spoke to the media today as they head toward their face-to-face -face meeting uh, in just a few hours here. And remember, you can watch NBC's coverage of the debate. It's right here on Local 4. Things will get started at 9 p.m., followed by Local 4 News at 11. So, Karen, it's a big night tonight. Um, the next debate will feature the vice presidential candidates Mike Pence and Kamala Harris. That will happen on October the 7th. For now, we'll send it back to you. All right, as we get into that final stretch of the race. Yep, we'll indeed. See you at 5, Kim. Thanks. Well, we do want to make sure that you have the facts as the two candidates try to score points tonight, and that is why Local Force Grant Herms and our Trust Index team will be watching the debate minute by minute, offering additional information in real time. The debate is on Local 4, as Kim just said, and we'll put the candidates' claims through the Trust Index at clickondetroit.com. Now, if you can't stay up late, Grant will be featured on Local 4 News today from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. with additional information. The COVID pandemic has put unprecedented pressure on parents and students and teachers. And today we're going to focus on concerns about the risk of teacher burnout. Paula Tutman shows us how the impact is building right now and could be felt for years to come. In most Metro Detroit school districts, school has been back in session for less than a month. And whether instructors are braving face-to-face -face or reinventing the wheel with remote teaching, we are seeing superhuman efforts to do right by students and their families. Welcome to um, another session of English 11. And now barely after school has begun, cracks are emerging, and educators believe that teachers are already starting to burn out. And our teachers work hard on a regular school year on a regular school day. This is significantly harder. Kenneth Gutman wears two hats as a superintendent for the Wald Lake Consolidated School District and the vice president of the Tri-County Alliance, which represents some 500,000 students and educators. But I do worry a great deal that those who are at the end of their careers or the beginning of their careers say, I don't need this. We met Von Seal Campbell of the Detroit Public Schools Community District, who reads stories to her students. And Natalie Ford, teaching remotely in the Berkeley School District, who says without her students, she feels she has lost part of her soul. And Sandy Wade of Westland, who rises early in the morning to work on lesson plans, fix technology, teach remotely, go home to teach her children, and then grade papers and answer phone calls at all hours of the night. I am worried about burnout. Sometimes I can sustain it for one day. Like, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes it's, yeah, like I can sustain it for like one day and then the day's over and I'm like, okay. We're going to do it again. Sometimes I just try and get through the one day or even one hour. You know, if you get through that one hour, um, sustaining it, I don't know, sustaining it for more than a couple of months, I think is going to be hard. People aren't going into teaching and I'm afraid that this will cause fewer people to enter colleges of education, which will further deplete the workforce of such a critical profession. Dr. Jennifer Green is the superintendent for Southfield Public Schools. Within the next three years moving forward, uh, based on our average, we would potentially have 87 teachers that we would need to replace. That is not taking into account the um, concern relative to COVID-19. It could potentially be 120 or more teachers that we would need to replace. That is a quarter of our, of our teaching staff.
Yeah, so you can see that this is not just a now concern. This is a future concern. Now, I can tell you that some districts, not all, but some school districts are micro-focused, not only on the students, but the teachers as well. Southfield was talking about a wellness program just for teachers. Kenneth Gutman, I thought, said something really interesting, Karen. He said, you know what could help is parents making sure they intentionally thank their teachers and give them a little more grace and patience, not a fix, but certainly afloat, it helps. But Karen, can you imagine, we're not even a month in and teachers are already talking about burnout. It, it's, uh, it, it's incredible. You do feel very, very, very sorry for them because they have so many different things that they're trying to balance. I think the patience and the thankfulness tip is really some good advice. Thanks, Paula. Still ahead, your first hit for another brick and mortar retailer getting into that same day delivery battle, how it works and what it's gonna cost you. As we mentioned, the CDC has come up with some guidance for Thanksgiving. We'll show you three higher risk activities you might want to avoid because of COVID. First, bad behavior outlawed. California taking action after a disgusting claim connected to Kobe Bryant's fatal crash. That story when we come back.